Well, welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar from the Open Group. Um, this event is being brought to us by uh, Enterprise Architects, which is an extremely active member of the Open Group. And our speaker today is uh, Enterprise Architects CEO, uh, Hugh Evans. Um, firstly, these are really good opportunities for you to uh, uh, talk to some really high class and highly experienced individuals like you. So we really, really would encourage you to ask questions. I know in the past that uh, Enterprise Architects have also always made their presentations available, and I know that the slide decks are always uh, popular with people who attend these events, and I'm sure that you will provide a link or give you an idea where you can get your slides in the future. So, Hugh, if you're ready, can I ask you to um, make a start? Sure. Thank you, Simon, and uh, th thanks very much to the Open Group for hosting this webinar. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Hugh Evans, as Simon mentioned, and uh, I'm I'm really uh, glad to have you all here on the line with me. Uh, this presentation is about disruptive innovation uh, and specifically digital disruption and the challenges and opportunities for all of us here in the EA world. This is uh, part of the lead up to the Open Group Conference later this month, which is focused on business tr transformation in finance, government and healthcare in London and I'm looking forward to catching up with a number of you at that event. Now, a little bit about uh, Enterprise Architects, uh, just a quick introduction. We're, we're a specialist enterprise ar architecture firm focused on strategic management consulting, training and talent services in the architecture field. We deliver projects all around the world, helping organisations to use architecture to improve their performance. Some upcoming events that should be on your radar, uh, we've already mentioned the Open Group Conference uh, later this month. Uh, we've got a bit of a special activity happening on the back side of that conference, which is uh, a two-day course, Discovering Business Architecture, which is a shortened version of our four-day public course. The four-day public course is actually being launched internationally in London the following week. So if you want to check that out, you'll find the details on our website. Shortly after, we have Chris Bradley, who's our Enterprise Services Director in the UK. He'll be delivering a key presentation on data modelling fundamentals at the Data and BI Conference in London. And then we have two further conferences happening in Australia in uh, November. So quite a busy uh, conference period for uh, EA over that time. Now, if you'd like to uh, join the discussion uh, with EA, you can find us at, uh, of course, our website, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you'd like to subscribe to our uh, blog, we're actually going to have a slide share version of this up on our blog in a few days' time. So uh, you'll be able to get the slides on SlideShare and uh, you'll also be able to uh, subscribe to our mailing list and, and our blog. So let's get started. I've got quite a lot to get through here. You would have already uh, have recognised that this presentation looks a little bit different, our usual presentations. Actually, Clayton Christensen, who coined the term disruptive innovation, said, you cannot analyse the future, you can only analyse the past. Uh, you have to imagine the future and create good theories that allow you to predict it. So this presentation is very much about the future of EA. And when I say EA, I mean both our business enterprise architects and, and the way that we see the industry of enterprise architecture evolving. Uh, this is a vision that we have for the development of the discipline. The presentation comes in three parts. The first part is focused on investigating really what is disruptive innovation. Uh, the second part is focused on the digital side of things and looking at digital disruption specifically. And finally, uh, we get into what this all means for EA and what are the challenges and opportunities for the practice as we see it. So as I mentioned, this is a sketch. I wouldn't take 2019 too literally, but it's really looking, looking into the future, maybe four, five, six years, and taking us from where we are today, which uh, for most organisations, uh, you know, even at the leading edge of architecture, uh, enterprise architecture means business architecture and enterprise-wide IT architecture. And we see this moving towards a, a much bigger picture story and very much uh, uh, supporting the challenges that are going to be confronting architects and organisations uh, around uh, the disruptive innovation and digital disruption story to a point where EA uh, will be much more about business design. So some of the uh, key ideas that I'm going to take you through. The shelf life for business models is shrinking. And uh, disruptive forces are now a key concern for CEOs. And they're not just a key concern for CEOs, they're a key concern for all of us. Understanding business capabilities is 
absolutely central to the disrupt disruption strategy for organisations and uh, for the effective execution of new business models. And this is, this is a key point because this is where uh, the architecture story hooks in and becomes relevant to the broader uh, disruptive innovation story. And as a consequence, a new architecture job family is emerging. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we believe that EA will equal business design. So what do I mean by disruptive forces? Uh, what exactly is disruptive innovation? Now, disruptive innovation is innovation that creates a new market. So think of the Apple iPod and, and the way in which uh, the Apple iPod changed uh, or created a market for digital music and, and, and how that evolved to, uh, to iTunes and, and, uh, and the other platforms that we now see uh, that, that present uh, digital content to customers. But also think about perhaps something that's not so contemporary. Think about gunpowder and how gunpowder actually changed the face of warfare centuries ago. Disruptive innovation is innovation that creates a new value network. Think of Facebook and the different businesses that actually fit within that eco ecosystem and generate value, uh, such as Zynga, which has made a, a huge business platform on the, uh, on the Facebook platform. Uh, think of Google uh, reshaping how people find goods and services through advertising. Now eventually disruptive innovation disrupts an existing market and value network. So you might think of things like the newspaper businesses and, and bricks and mortar retailers. Now newspapers are largely still in business and so are, are many bricks and mortar retailers. So it's, it's not that they're put out of business but, but that there are a number of disruptive forces that are actually materially affecting the performance of the businesses in those industries. And ultimately disruption displaces an, an earlier offering or technology. So think of uh, what's happened to the uh, telephone directories businesses that provided print directory and, uh, and what's happening in the uh, traditional mail side of things for the postal businesses. Now one common error that uh, people make when they think about disruption is that uh, they think that disruption is about differentiation. Differentiation on its own does not cause disruption. Disruption rips through an existing market and it combines differentiation and low cost. Now those two things aren't the only characteristics of, of disruption or disruptive innovation, but they are two key things, that, uh, two key ingredients that uh, you'll find in disruptive innovation and, and how it affects the market. In traditional markets we, we have uh, the circumstance where businesses need to compete on the value cost trade-off, so either they create products that deliver features and value propositions that the, the customer segment engages with or they present a, a product at a low cost that customers see as great value. In the uh, red ocean, in the traditional markets, we see uh, an, an alignment with either this uh, differentiation or low cost. In a blue ocean, we see uh, value innovation occurring where, where the new entrants create a value offering that uh, really breaks that value cost trade-off and uh, allows the customer to align not only with or, or to draw from the differentiation and the low cost that's being offered by the uh, disruptive entrant. And this, this idea of low cost is quite key because initially a disruptive entrant in disruptive innovation typically will provide an inferior product to what's available in the market in terms of its sophistication. But the quality of what it, what it actually offers, the one or two things that it actually offers to the customer is exactly what that particular customer segment is looking for and it offers it at a game-changing price uh, on a game-changing cost structure. And the challenge for the incumbent to compete with that is, is that they are carrying a significant cost base with their incumbent operating model and way of doing business and uh, it's nigh and impossible for them to uh, restructure their organisation to deliver a competitive product at that cost. So broadly speaking, there are, there are two types of innovations. In, in business in this context, you have uh, sustaining innovations where uh, incumbents improve product feature set, uh, they innovate the product and in that, in that type of market, the incumbents with the market share and the share, the mind share and the share of voice in those markets nearly always win. With disruptive entrants who uh, cut across that market with a value offering that the incumbents can't match, the disruptive entrants nearly always win. So when does disruption occur? Many people think disruption occurs when the disruptive entrant comes into the market, but it's actually when 
that uh, entrant has reached a point of market penetration that actually exceeds the leading incumbent organisation. Now, looking at the business landscape that architects would consider, there's a key point to note here. This diagram looks at the business motivation model, the business model canvas at the business model level, the value discipline orientation of operational excellence, product leadership and customer intimacy, and uh, the capability model, and the underlying people, process and technology and the information flows. Now, disruption and disruptive innovation occurs at a business model level. And this is a, this is a key point to take into account because most of us in, in the architecture world are uh, operating at this, in this lower area of you know, typically on the process and technology and information domain. And uh, the more advanced organisations with business architecture are, are now using capability-based planning uh, as a, and, and business motivation as a key orientation to the uh, architectural work that's being done. But you can see here that, uh, that we need, really need to look at the broader landscape, the broader business landscape in the context of, of disruption. Now I uh, attended a function in Holland a few months ago and um, uh, with the Business Model Inc guys uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, those guys are fantastic. If you haven't uh, come across them, you should check them out. Uh, specialists in the uh, business model innovation space. Uh, and uh, Patrick Vanderpeel, who is, a, uh, who is the CEO of that uh, organisation, is one of the uh, authors and, and in fact the producer of, the, of Business Model Generation which was the book published uh, uh, by that crew in Osterwalder and, and Pinya. Now, I caught up with uh, Alexander Osterwalder at one of his presentations at that event, and he took us through the uh, business model mechanics. And, and really what this speaks to is, is the fact that disruption, whilst the differentiation and low cost dimensions to it are very important, there are actually a number of dimensions to disruptive business models that, uh, that also can be taken to, into account. And I'm going to quickly zip through some of them. So you've got uh, switching costs. Uh, so how expensive is it for your customer to switch to another provider? Think of iTunes. You know, all, all my music is on one platform. Do I really want to, I've spent a lot of money to get it onto that platform. Do I really want to shift? Uh, protection from competition. How hard is it to compete? You know, think of Google. Who else can give me the reach I'm after with AdWords? Getting others to do the work. How can you get the external community to do the heavy lifting? Think of Facebook and uh, a billion people generating the product, their product for free. Scalability, how big and how fast can you grow? Think of Twitter, just need to sign up. Earn before you spend, uh, how can you run a business with little or no working capital up front? You know, think of the Dell model, you pay me, I'll build it and then I'll send it to you. Recurring revenues, how often can you click the ticket without having to sell again? Think of Uber, some of you might have come across Uber, sign up, with Uber and uh, Uber will take 20% of, uh, of the ticket on, of uh, all car fares. A great business model. And game changing cost structures. How can you run a big business on, rel on a relatively small cost base? Think of Facebook. Again, uh, a few thousand people supporting more than a billion users because they do all the work. Now I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the industry life cycle here and show you how the uh, disruptive entrants move through the industry life cycle. So the disruptor enters, enters and uh, whilst they've started with a disruptive innovation, um, over time they improve the feature set of that disruptive innovation and, and they go through a more sustaining innovation process. Eventually reaching a point uh, known as the shakeout phase where a number of entrants have joined, uh, they've seen the opportunity and, uh, and a particular product wins out. And we shift from product innovation into process innovation and ultimately into the stage of maturity where market share, uh, revenue of course, and, and uh, the cost per unit become the key for those fighting in that market. Now, the, the reason why I draw your attention to this is, is that you can map the value disciplines uh, to these stages. And this becomes important when we think about value dis discipline orientation uh, in our operating model and, uh, and our business model. And, uh, and, and how we respond to that. So in this example you see uh, in the introduction and growth phase, uh, the orientation in the business model canvas is a, is a value proposition centricity uh, and, and uh, at a capability level, uh, an orientation towards product leadership and product uh, management. 
Then we move into uh, the maturity phase where, where a business needs to make a choice between customer intimacy and operational excellence as, as its core value discipline. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't do all three of these things, but uh, from an operating model perspective, you, you, you focus on one. And then in the decline phase, uh, you try and uh, sweat the, uh, uh, the, the industry as, as much as you can by reducing your costs and, and producing as much operating leverage as possible. And so now we move on to what I regard as a very key slide in this presentation, and that is uh, the idea of life cycles. So you'll be familiar with the product life cycle and, uh, and of course, uh, business models. You know, people don't think of business models necessarily as actually having a shelf life. But uh, you know, maybe 30 or 40 years ago, uh, organisations could relax uh, in, the, in the hope that their, their business would actually have a very long, useful life. But the, the issues that are occurring now with disruptive innovation, and, and as I'll go through with digital disruption, are creating some significant problems for businesses uh, in being able to sustain a business model for, for the you know, 20 or 30 years. You know, perhaps it's now more, more like you know, five, eight, ten years for a business model. Also, the business capabilities that provide the platform for the product delivery and for the, for the production of the business model um, also need to flex uh, and, and support that over time. So there's another life cycle going on there. And we have the brand platform. And uh, you notice in this, in this uh, representation that the idea is that the brand actually outlives the business model. You know, think of uh, Virgin and the success of the Virgin brand and the way in which that's been reapplied across many industries. That's uh, a great example. And, uh, and more broadly, the, the enterprise. You know, the, and when I talk about enterprise here, I'm, there are many enterprises within the enterprise, you might say, but this is the big enterprise. This is the big picture. And this is really thinking about the perpetual going concern. And the challenge for an organisation is how do they manage these life cycles in a way that brings the capability readiness at the right time, commissions and decommissions that capability, to be able to support the product delivery the platform uh, to, to, to enable that and the platform to enact and decommission the business models. And these life cycles, as you can see, also map to the value discipline. And, uh, and it's our view that uh, uh, architects really need to understand how to synchronise and uh, harmonise these life cycles. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the idea of chunking in architecture, which is about you know, how do you focus different architectural capabilities across different parts of the business to be able to uh, bring architecture thinking through the organisation in, in a coherent and cohesive manner. And uh, you know, it's our view that, uh, that, that the challenges for organisations to think about uh, bringing business models online and, uh, and, and shifting from one business model to the next and enabling the, the product platform and the, and the capability really requires that, uh, that type of thinking. So I hold that thought because I'm going to come back to that in, in a further part of the conversation. So let's just get on to digital and understand why digital is so important. Digital matters because it accelerates the rate of disruption. It uh, democratises the new technology provide, providing greater access. And access is a key point because more access and speed provides greater scale and scope of uh, market penetration for those that are leveraging uh, that di digital capability. The essence of this story is, is that uh, being able to produce, distribute and market a product using digital means fundamentally accelerates the rate of disruption if this is a, dis uh, a disruptive innovation that's being brought to the table. And uh, this is where this, this idea of business models and the shelf life of business models become so important. Now, when we talk about digital, most of the literature you'll see uh, in, uh, in, in much of the commentary today is looking at the uh, definition of cloud, mobile, social, and big data. But it's our view that digital is, is much, much bigger than that. And this gives you a sense of you know, what's coming uh, and, uh, and, and how this is not just a steady state, but this is a, a growing, uh, intensifying uh, scenario. Think of the, uh, the emergence, the inter Internet of Things, of devices talking to devices, wear wearable computing, not just Google Glass, but you know, devices that can sit inside your clothing and monitor your heart rate and your, your, your uh, general well-being. Uh, 
think of artificial intelligence, uh, applications being able to generate applications to create responsive, seamless experiences across multiple platforms. Uh, think of gamification, shaping uh, customer and employee behaviour. Think of personalised, seamless experiences, and, you know, the, the, the expectation of customers for ultra personalization to be treated as an individual. And think of all the other things going on, service computing, smart sensors, and, and, and the fact that we're moving to a point where cloud's not really, it's not about cloud, it's just about having computers everywhere surrounding us. Uh, because the, the resources and the facilities of computers will just converge to a point where, where it will become uh, a non-issue. Computing, storage, and network resources are fully available uh, on mass everywhere. So digitization shifts power to the consumer. And uh, consumers expect, already expect personalized product experiences. And in the future, this is going to intensify. So if, if you're an organization and, and you're competing against uh, other organizations that have been able to deploy this ability to create a personal relationship with uh, their customers, you're in deep trouble if you can't, if you can't match them and, and, and possibly overtake them. And what's going on here is uh, looking at the business model canvas again is that the power shift to consumers is pushing businesses towards the right. And uh, in many ways this, this uh, reflects this sort of left brain, right brain thinking. On the business model canvas on the left side you have, you have a, a resource orientation. In the centre you have a value proposition or product orientation. And on the right you have the customer, customer centricity uh, orientation. And what we're seeing is that uh, uh, an increasing demand for a customer-centric approach. And in our firm, uh, we're seeing more and more uh, across our customer base uh, all around the world uh, this shift in thinking towards a customer-centric approach. And we're seeing a, a variety of different digital initiatives and transformations occur to actually support that. So as business becomes more prone to disruptive forces and as digital capabilities increase the speed and scale of the impact, make no mistake, everybody, every CEO in every industry must prepare. Enterprise must now understand how to design and execute new business models. Now this was a, this was a message that came through loud and clear a few months back in uh, the presentation from Alexander Osterwalder and, and it's something that really resonates with us because it's totally consistent with with what we're seeing in the, in, in the marketplace. So, the question is, uh, why EA? What's, uh, what's so important about EA that uh, uh, makes EA relevant in this, uh, in this picture? So I mentioned before that uh, disruption occurs at a, at a business model level. But one key point to take into account is that if you're looking at different scenarios at a business model level about how you might bring a game-changing uh, business model uh, to the market, you, you really need to understand what capabilities you've actually got in your existing platform to actually enable that uh, strategic scenario. So it's, it's one thing to be able to ideate and, and come up with these things, but it's another thing to actually understand the doability, the viability of actually executing that on that strategy. And this is, a, this is really a key point because architects have been playing in this field for a long time. So not only do architects understand business capability um, and not, not trying to get caught up in this old uh, discussion about you know, IT being buried in the, in, in the technology world, but let's not, let's make no mistake, the fact is, is Architects have a deep understanding of technology. They have a deep understanding. The current crop, crop of architects have, a, have a, come from a, typically come from a technology heritage aside from the emerging business architects in many cases. And, um, and this understanding of technology, which is really central to, to, to many organizations and particularly in the, in the digitization of, of businesses, is a very, very key uh, point of value for the architecture community to leverage when, when looking at the, uh, the, opportunity, the, the needs, if you like, of the organisation around us. But uh, the challenge for architects in that context is to be able to lift their conversation to the right level, uh, in the right way, to the right people to be able to have that discussion. 
So let's not turn away from technology. Let's recognise that we need to know what's in our platform, what, we, what capabilities, technology capabilities can be leveraged, uh, and also at a business level, what, what business capabilities can be leveraged in our platform, uh, and also what needs to be acquired and developed uh, to be able to put in place a uh, particular disruptive strategy. So we often uh, talk about the architecture mandate. Uh, this is a document come up in previous uh, presentations from Enterprise Architects. Uh, most organisations are here, which is uh, they've evolved from architectures about projects and then you know, portfolio and programs to a point where it's about improving operation and, uh, and business capabilities and, and, and enabling transformation and building the platform that uh, organisations then, can then uh, compete from. But architects, in our view of the world, also need to take, take this further. And, and you'll see this, uh, this, this lining up with some of the previous slides around the uh, life cycles, um, the enterprise life cycles, and, uh, and the value discipline orientation. So here we have a focus on improving product and service performance. And then beyond that, improving market performance. And beyond that, improving business model portfolio performance, recognising that we need to Think of business model generation as a, as a key capability for organisations to develop. Uh, we need a production line of business models and we need a, a, a separate capability to execute them. Now, I won't dwell on this slide too much. Um, it looks a bit busy, but really what this is trying to convey, and you can look at this if you go back through the, uh, through the recording or, or in the slide share, but, but quite simply this is trying to convey the urgency um, in different industries, uh, disruption is going to sweep and, and, and take effect uh, at different time scales. And uh, if organisations are going to need to get their act together to, um, to prepare for disruption and ideally actually be on the, uh, on, on the side of actually prosecuting the disruption rather than on the receiving end of it, they're going to have to stay ahead of the curve. And this is really... The, the mindset that, uh, that they need to adopt to recognise that they need to bring architecture thinking up to stack, to use that understanding of business capabilities and the doability of different business model scenarios and bring that architecture thinking through, uh, uh, through the organisation to the right level. So architecture thinking needs to go up and down the strategic stack. So uh, we, we, we all know the business capability anchor model, looking at uh, also both uh, functional and uh, cross-functional capabilities. Uh, we, of course, we know about people, process and technology and the information flows. Uh, I, I will make one point here that uh, the people side of capability uh, is, I think, something that's been underdeveloped uh, in, in architectural practice and thinking to date. Now, we have a lot of maturity in our process and technology uh, capabilities and, and architecture, uh, but, uh, but the capability readiness of people across uh, across a business transformation and um, in, the, in the development of, of new business models is, is a very, very key thing and, and architecture thinking can be brought to that. That's something that uh, our chief architect, Craig Martin, will be speaking to very specifically in, uh, in the conference that uh, is occurring uh, later this month uh, in London at the Open Group, with the Open Group. So the business motivation model, which is something that we use as a, as a key reference to orientate thinking uh, for uh, you know, essentially what's driving the organisation and what does a good decision look like. And uh, now the, uh, the development of the business model canvas as a, as a key part of the stack and, uh, and of course the, the value discipline orientation. So, Where we see this heading is, is uh, the development of a new job family for architects. Now, this job family will complement uh, the existing uh, uh, enterprise architecture job family, and uh, it's, uh, it's really a logical extension. And uh, perhaps many of these people will not come from architecture backgrounds, while some, some will. Uh, but the way that we, we see this evolving is, is an alignment to the life cycles and to the value disciplines that an organisation needs to support. So at the top level, we see the, the environment 
and uh, the candidate business model, so the business model design, uh, being supported by by a role uh, along the lines of a strategic business architect or business designer. At the market model level, uh, we we might see the emergence of the business architect uh, with a market orientation. And then at the product and services model level, a product and proposition oriented business architect. And uh, at the operating model level, a business capability architect incorporating people, process, technology and uh, information. So you can see that uh, these architects take the business model view as well as the value discipline alignment uh, down through that, uh, that decomposition. And uh, in many organisations you might find that you have all four of these roles emerge over time, uh, but uh, at any given time a particular value discipline orientation will, will require a particular emphasis at either the market, product or operating model levels. So what does a strategic business architect or business designer look like? Well, uh, this, this role we see, and let me just say that these, these concepts here, are, this is a sketch. This is not uh, meant to be a definitive, comprehensive statement. This is designed to give you a feel, a feel for where this is headed, uh, what sort of people might, might be uh, uh, taking on these types of responsibilities and, uh, and, and, and how it might uh, develop. So, the way we see things developing is, is the potential for the biz designer, business designer, to, uh, to who, would, who would invariably uh, have a very, very strong understanding of business context, of uh, the strategic management disciplines, uh, of uh, disruptive forces, of course, uh, understanding the asset and enterprise life cycles, uh, would inherently understand business model innovation and scenarios, and uh, uh, would essentially be able to mix it uh, at the very, very senior level within inside the organisation. The sort of things that, uh, the sort of personality they might be, the sort of things they might dream about would, would be uh, that they'd, they'd be into potentially pattern based thinking, that they'd, they'd uh, be very future oriented, very driven, very high performance focused uh, people. And um, in, of course these types of people, uh, as you'd expect, would need to be exceptionally uh, intelligent and capable people to be able to mix it. With the, uh, with, the, with the top level of business and uh, of course the people that they would deal with or speak to uh, would, uh, would be the heads of business. The business architect with a market orientation would be looking at, uh, would need to have a deep empathy, a deep understanding of what motivates people, uh, a, a good understanding of personalisation and, and, and how to bring individual experience, individualised experiences to the customers. They need to understand the commercialisation process and, uh, and, and go to market, be very tuned into trends, uh, a very good uh, deep understanding of uh, digitisation and, uh, and of course the, the channel strategy, uh, customer segments, uh, industry dynamics, that sort of thing. And uh, the, the sorts of things they might imagine would be uh, again very future oriented. Uh, you know, the sort of the sort of I imagine this would be the sort of person who would love uh, Mad Men for, for those of you who like that show. Uh, they'd be into viral behaviour and um, and memes and 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 just just, just behaviours. How how people interact with each other, how they interact online, and how they interact with with uh, a value offering. These, this role would. Uh, draw from a deep ability to, to empathise um, and we'd see this, this role as being slightly centre right. I think architects generally uh, have a good balance between left and right brain thinking. Uh, but we would, might imagine that this role would be slightly more biased towards the emotive, the engaging, uh, uh, certainly drawing from analytical data but, uh, but also being able to work with instincts and understand timing intuitively. And this role, as with, uh, with the other role, would, uh, would certainly speak with the, and deal with the, the senior members of the organisation, but uh, would also have a uh, you know, strong dialogue and uh, support the, the role of the CMO, uh, so marketing, uh, product development, sales, 
uh, strategy, etc. Let me say that some some people might read into this and think, you know, are these roles currently being delivered by other people within within the organisation? And of course, to a, to a great extent, they are. But uh, we see the role of, of of an architect, a business architect, uh, at bringing architecture thinking to the to the challenge as uh, as a, as a key support person and advisor to help to elicit the right content and to be able to synthesize information up and down the stack with their architectural colleagues in such a way that, so that the uh, business decision makers can make good decisions about how they're going to uh, uh, execute their strategy and, and uh, change their organization. The business architect with a product and proposition orientation will uh, of course, need to understand innovation. Uh, they, they need to understand uh, you know, product platforms, uh, pricing, of course, you know, promotion, place, these, these sorts of things. Uh, we believe a very strong understanding of digitization and, and technology, uh, that uh, they'll have a great eye for design, a good sense for, uh, for partnerships, uh, for the supply chain and the, uh, the value chain. And, uh, and really have a deep understanding of uh, the value of product, user, and customer experience to, um, uh, to their uh, organization. The ideas of, uh, of utility, of, of generating delight, of uh, bringing products to market, of, of you know, industrial design would be very much in their, in their mindset. And um, you know, these people, again, as with uh, uh, all architects, would be uh, super smart and uh, meticulous planners. Uh, and and, I, and we, and I see this role as a very much a center brain thinking role. Uh, it's a role that really does balance the, the analytical with the uh, intuitive and a, and a good understanding and balance between form and function. And uh, as you'd expect, again, dealing with leadership in the business uh, with uh, also an emphasis into uh, product development and um, into a business development and sales. The business capability architect. Now you'll notice that this, this is actually a role that exists today and, and, uh, and, and this is the juncture, I think, for, for where the enterprise architecture discipline currently resides. Uh, we're seeing a convergence to some extent between the uh, business analysis uh, universe and the uh, traditional enterprise architecture universe uh, at the business architecture level and, uh, and then up into the strategic architecture layer. And uh, what you see here is a number of the things you might expect to see with a, a traditional uh, enterprise architect uh, and, uh, and business architect. So you're seeing things like uh, knowing about function, process, uh, business services, information data, uh, applications, operating models, business capabilities, strategy, uh, motivation models, that type of thing. Uh, but added to that, uh, you'll see in this, this idea, uh, the idea of uh, organizational design, of um, gamification, of understanding of human behavior. So you might see a, uh, a, a decomposition, if you like, or a specialization within the, the business capability architect layer uh, for people capability specialists, as well as process and technology and information capability specialists. These types of people would uh, invariably uh, love the idea of using technology to make their life better. So um, uh, they might dream about telecommuting from the beach. Um, they'd love uh, you know, futuristic ideas, um, games, technology, uh, diplomacy, politics, and typically they would uh, but be great communicators, great listeners, um, have uh, would be perhaps a slight bias to the centre left with uh, uh, centre left brain thinking with this type of role. Um, I, my experience and our experience here has been very much that uh, the architecture community have been just slightly biased towards the analytical side to date, and um, and and would see that this role uh, uh, potentially might uh, might do that, but perhaps not the uh, the people oriented business capability architect. Um, this role would certainly have a deep understanding of innovation and technology and, and no doubt uh, have experienced um, business transformation over and over. And, um, and of course, again, dealing with the leadership, uh, but also having that uh, deep connection into the, uh, 
technology domains with the Chief Digital Officer, the CIO, uh, the Chief Knowledge Officer and IT Head, etc. So the sort of deliverables that these roles might, uh, might produce, uh, at the strategic layer you might see things like uh, uh, business model canvas, uh, looking at uh, you know, vision canvases, business model canvas, uh, looking at different types of uh, business model scenarios and testing that through uh, various types of uh, engagement with inside the organisation, inside the organisation, and also external with customers. Um, you might see uh, uh, you know, pest cell type uh, uh, scanning and uh, you know good understanding of business motivation. Uh, the business architect market orientation level. Uh, you might see deliverables such as journey maps, customer experience views, uh, looking at brand architecture and uh, with the business architect at the product and offering uh, or proposition layer you'd see things like value maps and product design models and roadmaps and the business capability uh, architect, you know, things like value chains analysis, uh, business capability anchor models uh, and your traditional BDAT models uh, that uh, most of us have all seen. So, just to recap, to give us some time for questions, I want to reiterate that the, uh, the shelf life for business models is shrinking. And these disruptive forces, uh, the, the circumstances that uh, we're all in now, uh, uh, if, if CEOs are not paying attention to the effects of disruptive innovation or the potential effects and, uh, and indeed digitisation in, inside their organisations, um, they uh, may well be prone to uh, some um, very strong uh, shake-ups in, uh, in their industry. Uh, understanding business capabilities is very central to uh, disruption strategy and execution and, and this is where architects get, get dealt into the story and get an opportunity to move up and down the stack. And uh, as a consequence, we believe a new architecture job family is emerging. And uh, ultimately, EA will indeed equal business design. So that brings to a conclusion uh, this part of the presentation. I'm, I'm uh, very happy to open up to questions. And if you don't get uh, an opportunity to ask your question, uh, feel free, please do reach out uh, through one of these channels. Uh, we're really keen to, uh, to engage with everyone uh, on this story because we believe it's a very important story uh, for the EA industry to get behind. That's great, Hugh. Many, many thanks. And uh, by the way, I do like your engaging approach uh, to your presentation today. Really, really good, that. Um, yeah, we have a few questions. Before I get on to those, Hugh, can I just reiterate or uh, refresh everyone's uh, mind on how to get hold of your slides? We've had a few inquiries already. What would be the best way to get hold of a copy of your slides, Hugh? Sure. Um, in, a, in a few days' time, we'll be publishing a follow-up uh, blog uh, on our website, uh, which uh, w where I'll, I'll seek to uh, cover off any questions that have been asked uh, that, that uh, didn't get airplay uh, in this session. And uh, we'll, we'll be uploading this to SlideShare so that uh, everybody can download it from SlideShare. You'll be able to find it on our blog. That's fantastic. And everyone, if, if, you, if, if anyone experiences any uh, problems with that, then you can always send me an email and I can act as the go-between and uh, uh, smooth any uh, process issues with that. Yeah, right. Okay, let's get on to a few questions. Um, we've got one question here from Mohammed, which is kind of duplicated by a few people, and he's asking, what tool do you use for EA and what future capabilities and EA tools would you like to see? Well, you can, you can see uh, by this presentation I particularly like the pen and the pad. Um, but uh, th there was actually one uh, part of the presentation for just, just for the uh, brevity uh, uh, that didn't make it in the final cut which talks about uh, um, architecture thinking and um, uh, I, some of, most of you won't know that I actually have a traditional architecture background in, uh, of uh, building construction and, um, and uh, in uh, traditional architecture you have three phases um, you have the concept phase, the documentation phase, and the contract administration phase. And uh, in, a, in the traditional architecture space, um, the concept phase is typically done just like this presentation with uh, hand-drawn concepts 
um, ideation, getting people on board. And I actually think that this is a style that architects really need to start to think about um, using uh, to engage people very early on in the process at a conceptual level. And then as we go into the documentation phase, um, uh, you go into the build documents, just like people use you know, AutoCAD and business information modeling in the traditional architecture context. And then uh, finally, as you go through the actual contract administration, which is kind of like the transformation governance phase in enterprise architecture, um, you would uh, use a combination of things. Uh, so, because ultimately at that stage, you're dealing with the journey management to, to make sure that everybody's involved uh, and engaged with what is actually being delivered. So just to, just to bring that into a succinct statement, um, tools, uh, look, we uh, use a variety of different tools, um, you know, really anything in the, in the, in the magic quadrant uh, in the documentation phase and that sort of middle phase. We're increasingly using graphic facilitation, um, so the, the, the pen and the paper and whiteboards and, and uh, you know, getting people into a room and, and running through, you know, uh, gamified workshops and that sort of thing. And uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the final phase, uh, you know, using a combination between uh, you know, strong visioning documents, uh, you know, architectural review uh, documents and, and, the, and the usual stuff you'd expect, and, uh, uh, and uh, anything else that's going to uh, you know, connect people with the performance of the transformation and keep them abreast of how how their life is, life is going to be affected by it. Okay, Hugh, thank you for that. We've got a couple of questions here that are on the similar subject. One's from Devon And and the other is from Alexander, asking, do you currently see the creation of a business architecture function in your clients similar to EA function? And Devon And is saying similarly, he's saying, is EA transforming to BA? Uh, good question. Uh, I think it, it varies in different organisations. In some organisations, we've seen the business architecture function develop outside of the EA function. Uh, in other organisations, we've seen the business architecture function develop inside the EA function but still be reporting into IT. In the more uh, mature and, and uh, developed organisations, uh, I think what we, we, we start to see is a, uh, an enterprise transformation function reporting into the chief operating officer often and uh, that transformation function is not just about IT, it's about the whole people, process and technology and business capabilities that are being commissioned and decommissioned over the, uh, over the journey of the transformation. So uh, you know, it's our view that uh, at this stage of maturity in the market that uh, you know, business architecture um, probably should uh, be sitting uh, into the uh, COO line or, or perhaps into another line outside of IT. Um, but I don't think that this has entirely resolved itself in, in many organisations. And if you, if you look at this particular presentation I've just delivered, um, this is painting a vision that's well beyond that, uh, that's looking at uh, architecture you know, being highly visible at the CEO and the board level and, um, and being seen as a key facilitator, not the hero, not the person with all the answers, but the person who can actually elicit and facilitate the right discussions at the right levels on the right issues to, to manage the life cycles and to produce the right outcomes and uh, support the right decisions that, uh, over, the, over the journey of the business. Okay, thanks, Hugh. And I'm going to uh, combine another two questions here on similar subjects. One's from Richard uh, and one is from uh, Nico. Um, uh, and, and they're about job families. And Richard asks, uh, the new job families look like business consulting, particularly as they are just advisory and not decision making. How do you see these roles relating to actual business consultants? And Nico <laughs> says, what is the timeline on the new job family? Is it currently, or place, is it currently in place or near future? Okay, so I'll, I'll take the, the first question first. Um, the question of uh, consulting in, in this context, I actually think that uh, in many respects uh, the, the architecture function inside an organisation is, is the development of an internal consultancy uh, to the business that's wholly aligned to the business interests. And um, uh, the challenge I guess for organisations is to bring the right level of architecture capability online when they need it. And, and that's 
you know, very, very difficult, which is why a number of them have to go externally. Um, on the management consulting outside of the business story, um, I think that the, the future is quite bright for architects in the management consulting space because the, there is an imminent disruption to the consulting uh, business model uh, around the world, and I think that disruption is actually targeting the very large organisations with fairly generic offerings, um, with some degree of specialisation across their organisation. But the, the, the client community is really looking for niche specialist expertise, and, uh, and, and as a consequence, uh, I think architects are in a pretty good position uh, from a consultancy perspective to, to offer that. Um, on the second question about the timeline, uh, I, I believe that um, there are some very, very forward-thinking organisations out there that soak this up and rapidly respond. Um, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me if we uh, uh, would find you know, a scattering of organisations that are already putting this type of thinking into practice. Probably the more agile, um, you know, mid middle scale, mid scale organisations that uh, uh, apply architecture thinking. However, I think for the mainstream, the reality is that, that this is going to be a, uh, a three to five year uh, phase. Uh, until we start to see you know, a, a genuine proliferation of this uh, business architecture up and down the, um, the stack, uh, complementing the, the incumbent architecture capabilities, and um, and for the for the for the very broad market, you know, I think that that could be still even some time away beyond that. So, uh, however, um, getting back to the imperative to act slide uh, a bit earlier, you know that. Uh, I think that some organisations are actually uh, uh, going to miss the boat and that they're going to be behind the curve. And uh, if they'd actually considered accelerating their architecture investment and mandate, they may, may well have got ahead of the curve a hell of a lot quick, um, quicker. Thanks, Hugh. A uh, question here from Bruce. It's a, it's a rather long one, so um, I may have to reread it. But it's from Bruce. Is there any push within the EA discipline to develop EA methodologies that not only produce architecture design, but generate actual data and business analytics to reflect IT asset costs, savings for new capabilities being deployed within an enterprise. Did you get all that, Hugh? Yeah, yeah, I got it. I, look, absolutely. I mean, there, there are a number of, you know, a number of the big EA players out there are, in fact, um, you know, vendors who, uh, who who provide different analytical uh, tools and platforms that uh, have largely, you know, uh, automated that process. You know, um, requiring you know the right kind of data input and the right kind of uh, operation and management. And uh, you know, I think that that kind of thing does exist. Um, if if the question is implying that you know maybe the architecture role could be made redundant somewhat through through a tool set through sort of an analytical um, uh, or analytics capability, I, I, I really doubt it because. You know, in architecture, the reality is is 80, 90 percent of the challenge is the person. It's not, it's not even, it's not process or the technology. You know, the process and technology is kind of hygiene, and architecture process is not rocket science. It's a fairly straightforward thing to do um, uh, once you understand the, the steps. But the ability to bring the right people uh, with the right ability to engage, uh, synthesize, you know, generate, synthesize, elicit, you know, make the recommendations navigate the politics, do all the things that you need to do to, to be seen as a trusted advisor and uh, uh, you know, valuable inside an organisation really comes down to the people. So, so I, I, you know, and, and Craig Martin's going to talk a lot about that uh, at the Open Group Conference in a couple of weeks. Okay, thanks Hugh. I'd like to move on to this question from David. He's asking, if a company is fast approaching decline of the cycle, what are the first steps to introduce a disruptive innovation strategy? Well, the first step is uh, understanding how to bring a uh, value innovation to the, to the table. So disruption is about uh, making com the competition irrelevant uh, by uh, bringing a configuration of uh, of a, of a technology or a product to the table that materially meets what the, the, the market's looking for at, at a cost the incumbents can't match. Now, if you're in the decline phase, 
um, the first thing you need to do is think about, well, you know, are we going to go to a whole new business model? Are we going to develop and adapt our existing business model? Um, what can we leverage in our capability uh, stack that, uh, that can be used as a running head start to, uh, to be able to uh, affect a disruptive strategy? So uh, you know, that may well be that I've got a very strong brand uh, that I can leverage because I've got a resonant position with a certain segment that I can bring a new product capability to the table. Um, you know, in, in Australia, there's a good example with uh, you know, the emergence of uh, Digital Post Australia, which is a, you know, a, a digital uh, business that's been built from the ground up that is leveraging the parent brand equity being Australia Post, which is one of the most trusted brands in Australia. So it's understanding what you can currently leverage and what you can acquire within your uh, partner network and, and, and within your reach and what you have the capability readiness to build in your enterprise platform is prerequisite to understanding how to execute an effective disruptive strategy at the business model level. Thank you. Clearly we're not going to get through all of the questions that people have kindly submitted today, but uh, if anyone would like to take their questions offline, you know, I'm sure we'd be more than happy to uh, help them with those, Hugh. You bet. Uh, Doug's question is, is there any way to start at the top with a, biz, um, a, a business model uh, development stroke transformation if you don't have a mature EA foundation? Can you actually uh, affect a disruptive strategy without a, a mature EA function or how do you go about doing it? Uh, look, I think that, that uh, there are a lot of smart people in organisations aside from architects who know a lot about their businesses and um, you know, that not, of course, you've got the CEO, you've got product heads, you've got people in the strategy department. You get a lot of people who know a lot about their business and know a lot about their ability to actually execute. Um, I think the point about architects is that they have a rich understanding of the capability profile of the business that uh, really uh, deeply understands the doability, the capability readiness and the maturity for an organisation to do it. So it's really the difference between gut feel that's coming from smart people in the business who know a lot about the business but don't necessarily have the uh, empirical data and the, and the, and the deep understanding of, uh, of capability uh, who, who could affect a uh, disruptive strategy and apply business model innovation but possibly not with the degree of um, uh, exact uh, performance that you would hope to, or more exacting performance you would hope to achieve with a, with a more rigorous architectural method. So this is from Scott and he's saying, uh, uh, amongst global corporations, can you identify some leaders and laggards as it relates to the business architecture view of, view of EA? And he's saying, noticing that some, especially legacy corporations, are moving organically towards this model. Yeah, look, I, I think I'm not going to call out any, any organisation in particular. I, I, I don't think it would be appropriate in this forum to do that. But uh, what, what, uh, what I will talk about is, is, is industry. Um, we've seen that uh, any uh, industry that fundamentally deals with data um, and, and uh, is under threat or, or can leverage uh, digitisation, uh, by digitisation, uh, is typically on... You know, they've got their, uh, their thinking together around, uh, around business architecture and around the, 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 the application of architecture thinking. So if you look to the insurance sector, you know, we're seeing a lot of interesting stuff happening in the insurance space, uh, in, the, in the banking and financial services to some extent, uh, or banking, banking to some extent in addition uh, to the other financial services. Um, you know, I think that there are some industries where, where architecture is sort of imbued in their thinking. If you, if you look at the... Uh, uh, automotive manufacturing industry, you know, they talk product architecture is absolutely part of their, their DNA and, um, and, and how they operate. So if you look at organisations, not, not necessarily pointing to them, but the organisations like Toyota perhaps, uh, these organisations are organisations that have architecture thinking well and truly imbued in them, so they're ready to be receptive to, uh, to a business architecture way of thinking. Now, on the laggard front, uh, I think you'll probably see, uh, you know, the, the organisations that are less impacted by, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges of, uh, of digitisation. Um, so, organisations that dig stuff out of the ground and, um, and that, uh, you know, deal with uh, very slow to change uh, industry cycles uh, are uh, perhaps less 
concerned with getting the business architecture up and running. That's great, Hugh. And I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'd like to thank everyone else for their time for uh, joining us. We would like to see you again at uh, future events. So, Hugh, do you have any f final words you'd like to close with today? Yeah, look, I just uh, really appreciate the opportunity from the Open Group. Um, just a, a reminder to everybody that uh, if you'd like to catch up in person, I'll be at the Open Group Conference in London uh, with Craig Martin hosting the professional development track. Also, if this stuff uh, piques your interest, as I mentioned, we've launched our Discovering Business Architecture course, and, and, and this uh, uh, material and these ideas are, are very much covered uh, in, this, uh, in this course. So, um, you know, we'd love to, to hear from you. And, uh, and please, uh, if you want to join the conversation on our website or, uh, or you know, through other channels, don't hesitate. So, you know, we, we'd love to uh, hear from you. Thanks very much. Okay, Hugh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll speak again soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.